So look at that. This is an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle. The, look at those reapers work. This is so cool and so amazing. They are actually used at oil platforms, at, at least these ones, to reduce danger and help workers. As I previously mentioned, ROV stands for Underwater Remote Operated Vehicles. These vehicles are occupied highly maneuverable underwater machines that can be used to explore ocean depths while being operated by somewhat at the water surface. How awesome! They allow us to explore the ocean without actually being in the ocean. They were first developed for industrial purposes, such as internal and external inspections of underwater pipelines and the structural testing of offshore platforms. Nowadays, they are not as expensive and big. They can be used for environmental monitoring and ocean research, and they have proven to be great allies at eliminating human presence in the water, thus reducing the risks that humans got under at diving operations. Uh, exotic vehicle from the team out of Mexico. That is the vehicle you see on the right hand part of the screen. The left hand part of the screen, we're looking at the Ohio State vehicle. Now, this team from Mexico, this is their first year competing uh, in, in the international competition. We are very excited to have uh, Mexican teams compete as they are our neighbors to the south. So now we are here with our neighbors to the north. Maybe one day we will be down with our neighbors to the south. So the video I just showed you was from the first time we were competing at Made International ROV Competition in 2015. Uh, that was our first design. And you can see here how amazing they are. They are equipped by grippers and thrusters and connectors. This is, the, this is this year's design. We are hoping to compete. But look at this. ROVs are so cool and so complex in many, many ways. They are controlled by a person typically on a surface vessel using a control system that is really similar to those in video games. They are equipped with cameras, light, grippers, sensors, water samplers, and general instrumentation required for each mission. The size of each vehicle can change depending on their use, so they can go from being as small as a computer, like this one, to being as large as a small truck. As we saw before, the ROVs integrate a large number of sensors and actuators in order to perform the task that they are meant to, to do. In order for the ROV to be able to move around, there should always be a propulsion system. It is typically formed by a thrusters arrangement that allows it to move in every direction. The thrusters used should be waterproof or electrically isolated. The thruster is integrated by the motor plus a 3, 4 to 5 blade propeller. Some of the considerations like habitation and ventilation must be considered for the correct design and performance. Another important aspect is the material that they are made with. Depending on the tasks your ROV has to perform, the propellers can be made out of plastic for low impact and small ROVs or even alloys for high impact tasks and big ROVs. This is a propeller developed by the company Blue Robotics. It is specifically designed for ROVs and underwater purposes. You can see the dimensions here. The diameter is around 100 millimeters and the weight is in water 120 grams. One of the most important characteristics when choosing the materials for the propellers is the fact that they will spend most of the time underwater. So they should be resistant to corrosion and harsh environmental conditions, as well as being light enough not to represent an obstacle for the ROV's mobility. That is why aluminum alloys are a popular material choice. Aluminum alloys are a group of elements which can be combined with basic aluminum, the dominant metal, to provide additional strength to, finish, to the finished metal. These elements are zinc, tin, silicon, copper, magnesium, or manganese. For underwater propellers manufacturing, using aluminum alloys offers great advantages as these ones because they withstand hot and cold treatments, resist corrosion, they are strong and durable, recyclable and odorless. As the propeller is made out of aluminum alloy, we have to think about it as a piece that can be casted in order to be manufactured. There are other processes, of course, but for the sake of this video and this challenge, we have to think about it as a casted part. Uh, at the first part of the general manufacturing process, we um, see that uh, we have to design the part that needs to be manufactured. So the schem schematics and SOLIDWORKS or other um, simulation processes. We have to choose the materials and the casting procedures. We have uh, the preparation of the raw materials once we chose the material. Uh, we have to do the preparation of, of the melting plant. We have to make the cores. We have to prepare patterns and machinery. After we have uh, prepared all of it, we start with the actual process. We put the alloy ingots in a furnace where they are heated. We, I have to make a point here. Um, this is a general overview, so we are not talking about the specific, but a general casting procedure. Then the, molten, the molten alloy is poured into a mixer with other powder metals or materials in order to form a different alloy or change the constitution of the original alloy. Um, then the pouring and casting uh, in the machine for the selected process. 
uh, we take the new casted piece out, the, then uh, a heat treatment comes if needed. Of course, if you need to change the the specific properties of a material, you, you can go through a heat treatment through a heat treatment, for example, uh, cooling it um, and then heating it again and then cooling it again. But in general, that's how it's made. Then um, after we have gone through all of it, we can do the finishing of the castings. So the cleaning, breeding, and the manual treatment that, that you can have um, made by hand by the workers. And then the mechanical mechanical treatment, if you get mechanical treatment of casting, so turning, milling, threading, depending on what you want to do with the piece. So if you want to have a, be a better result. Then, of course, the quality controls and testing. This is a really important part because um, out of all your production, you have to see if it meets the, the, the requirements that, for the process, process that is needed. For example, in the propeller case, uh, you have to see if it won't break under the water pressure. You have to see if it will leave any particle in the water because this is one of the requirements for ROVs to have minimum interaction. Or and at the end, of course, the packaging and shipment process. Uh, once you have your piece, you have to package it and then it will get to your customer directly. One of the main decisions we have to make uh, is which process to choose, which process is the best for the manufacture of our propeller. We have to take on, in consideration that depending on the quantity of the pieces we want, the finishing of them is which process we want, we have to use. So for example, we can choose between the expendable and permanent mold castings. In the expendable mold, mold castings, we have the investment casting, loss foam casting, single crystal casting, melt spinning process, and casting, shell mold casting, ceramic mold casting. Uh, some of them are more popular than others, and some of them are more affordable, but give different results to the cheap ones. But for example, in the permanent mold uh, casting, on the right, we can see that we have die casting, centrifugal casting, squeeze casting, and, and for example, slush casting. Depending on what we want to do and the requirements of our project is what kind of process we are going to see. In the next uh, slide, we will see some of the good and bad things about each one. For our propeller and the next piece of, of our ROV that we are going to analyze in this video, we have to compare different casting methods that can be good uh, in order to make. For example, let's, go, let's talk about investment casting. For the good part, we can have that it can cast intricate part shapes. It has an excellent surface finish and accuracy, and almost any metal can be casted with this method. For the drawbacks, uh, we have a limited part size and expensive pattern, molds, and labor. Another type of uh, casting method is uh, die casting. Uh, for the good part, uh, it has excellent dimensional accuracy, excellent surface finish, and high production rate. The drawbacks are that uh, the high die cost, the limited part size, limited to non ferrous metals, and long lead time. And last but not least, we have another expandable mold casting method uh, called sand casting. Uh, the good parts about it is that it is the most used casting process. It can cast nearly almost cast any casting alloys. Uh, because of its versatility, you can have from small to very large quantities of production and the low tooling cost. Uh, some drawbacks are that uh, some finishing is required. If you want to have good finishings, you have to do more machining. Um, and the white tolerances that it can ha have. Talking about all these methods and comparing them, you have to consider that the requirements of your part, if you want to make a small quantity, if you want to have a super high production, or if you want good finishing in your surfaces, uh, will give you the right path to choose which casting process is the best for your personal and particular need. This is how the general investment process uh, graphics look like. This is the one shown in the book. But this is how the block diagram of the investment casting will uh, look like. We have the injection of the wax, wax or casting pattern in the metal die. Uh, you can use the cores to form the internal features of the pattern. Then the wax pattern is ejected from the mold. The ejected pattern can be assembled into a tree or a pattern assembly. This tree is submerged in a slurry of, of ceramic. Then the trees take it out of the slurry and dry it to form a ceramic shell. Now that we have a ceramic shell, it is submerged around three times in stucco to create a multiple layer and it's, so it's more resistant. The, then this shell is placed into an oven and the wax is melted out. Now we have no wax and we have the complete one piece mold. The mold is heated around 100 Celsius 
Then the molten aluminum alloy is poured into the mold at the gating system. The molten aluminum alloy is allowed to cool and solidify. Then we take this mold and we shake it to leave the final uh, casted product just by itself so the sand goes away or the ceramic. And then the mechanical treatment for finishings and details and your casted piece is ready. The first part of the process is creating these molds and the tree arrange of different pieces. We can see the tooling in here. We have the wax patterns that are united with the wax gating system where the molten metal will flow later and the sprue and the runners. Uh, in the middle, the second image, we have a ceramic shell being um, coated with the, slur the, sur the slurry. When you make it hollow so you mold the wax away, you can now pour the metal using a ladle and then at the end you let it cool and the finished casting uh, is shaken up and you have the, the finished part that you need. When analyzing how much excess materials must be included in the inner diameter of the body to allow it to be accurately machined to its finished dimensions, we need to consider the normal shrinkage allowance for some metals uh, when casted in sand molds. So for example, in aluminum alloys, you will consider around 1-3% of shrinkage. You have to consider your total volume and then consider this percent. Or you can also cons uh, consider the solidi solidification timing. So in order, uh, if you know the solidification timing, you can know when to pour the metal out to avoid cracks during the cooling. When deciding if to use a single cavity mold or a multi cavity mold, you need to consider the amount of parts you're going to need. For example, if the Blue Robotics um, company is going to produce a lot because it's going to, uh, to mass produce them and sell them, maybe a multi cavity mold will allow them to create more parts per minute, but uh, it will be more expensive. If you need to just manufacturing one single propel, maybe a single committee mold will be the best option. We also have to consider the excess materials used in runners and other parts of the casting process because it is not part of the final mold, so it's not part of the complete product, but it can be reused for the next. This rule tries to calculate the cooling time of each part and it tries to relate the volume with the surface area. We can see in the upper part the equation that is used. Then we have the constant. Um, value that it's supposed to be calculated with different temperatures and density of the material to be casted. But in this case, we generalize and use the aluminum as the base material. And then um, I consider it to be molded in sand mold, but it's invested uh, casting, but it can be ceramic or sand. So with a SOLIDWORKS um, 3D drawing, I calculated the volume and the surface area. And then um, using this rule, I calculated that it's about 8.5 seconds for each part to cool. Another really important part of the ROV are the poggers, because you need to transmit data from the surface to the ROV, whatever it might be found. It can be 12 meters, 30 meters underwater. So they have to be really resistant. They have to transfer the data correctly. And also they have to be waterproof because these connectors will go connecting the outer signals to the inside of the waterproof box where all the electronics, electronics inside the ROV are. So they have to be really well made. The surface needs, needs to be really clean and they have to be millimetrically tested in order for them to work correctly. They can vary their size depending on the amount of loggers you need, of course, and they are sometimes made out of gold. They can be quite expensive, but they, but they are worth it as if they function correctly, everything in the ROV will work correctly. If you buy the cheap uh, versions of it, you might not have the, the results you want. So for example, these ones are made out of gold. One of the important things to mention here is that um, casting process might not be as possible for this kind of uh, object because they have to be super precise, as, precise as, a, as I said. They have to be millimetrically correct. So for this um, product, I chose the 3D printing manufacturing process because it meets the requirements for this product. Even if you think that metal 3D printing is a new technique, there are a lot of variations. For example, in this chart we show that uh, there is a version of powder, another version of pellet. You can also uh, use filament like the normal uh, plastic 3D printed, printing or dispersion and rods. There are a lot of types of um, techniques. They vary in results, of course, and also in price. As I previously mentioned, there is a lot of techniques, but this is a general diagram flowchart uh, where we can see the 3D printing process. First, the rock beating of the metal is done, then crushing it is crushed into small pieces, then fed to the induction furnace, then the melting of the metal happens, then the chamber vacuumization, the FDM of prototype, the cooling of the prototype, and the cleansing of the no.
I chose a directed energy deposition, which is one of the most used um, methods, the EED, that moves the energy into the heat stock by pointing the energy source that can be a laser, electron beam, or plasma, and then spraying powder or pushing the wire into the energy pack. The RC or plasma systems require high voltage energy source to maintain an arc, which is energy intensive and wasteful. We can see here the tooling. Uh, this is a general schematic, but we can see the wire feeder, the resolidified alloy, that is the one that um, the pro where the prototype is made, made here, and the electron beam, the molten alloy puddle, the prior deposition that is here, and the substrate. In general, uh, this is one of the most used methods, but you can um, you can differentiate between them by this part, if it's powder, pellets, or if it's wire in this case. In general, it is not a high volume production method, but it can be really helpful in um, producing parts like the one we are analyzing because it's super precise and it can be modified as much as the client wants. I think it was a good decision for the electrical pluggers for underwater vehicles method because it meets the requirements for these needed parts. At the end of the day, both products can be made of different material, uh, depending on the needs of every customer. And of course, the price will vary depending on the need of everyone. But for example, the propellers um, for the big ROVs I made, are made out of uh, metal, in this case, aluminum alloy. Because, for example, if you have a super big machine and you're going underwater and you find rocks or uh, a piece of plastic or something that could interfere in the thruster and break it, you will lose your entire machine underwater. There is no way to retrieve the ROV. So you want something strong that could cut through those rocks or through those plastics. But for example, for a small ROV, you don't need that much power because one, you cannot take it uh, too deep uh, inside the ocean. Uh, the most uh, normal or commercial or educational ROV can go uh, um, inside is about uh, 12 to 30 meters. So you don't meet that many obstacles and you can make it out of plastic and it's okay. For the connectors, um, you cannot conduct electricity with plastic. For example, the main core of the connectors, but not the outside part. Uh, the outside part can be made out of plastic. In fact, it has to be made out of plastic in order to be isolated. Uh, electrically isolated, but the main uh, pluggers are, have to be out of metal, and in this case, gold is the uh, best conductor. I will not replace the entire ROV with plastic, of course, because uh, <laughs> at the beginning, uh, one of the main reasons is because you have to conduct electricity, and plastics are not good conductors, so you cannot conduct signals. At least the pluggers have to be made out of metal, but uh, some of the parts of the ROV have to be made out of plastic, and the main structure can be plastic. Uh, Again, it depends on the needs of uh, every customer and every project. But for example, the propellers can be made of plastic. As you saw, the thruster case was made of plastic. The um, foaming coat is made out of plastic. The cameras, the, the containers that uh, contain the electronics can be made out of plastic. And of course, um, one of the advantages that plastic has over metal is that the corrosion resistance of plastic is better. It doesn't have to be painted with Winstead corrosive. And it can withstand uh, harsh environmental, um, environmental conditions. Uh, when considered all costs, including freight, installation, and service life, the metal system will, in most cases, be more expensive. And the exotic metal alloy system can cost up to 13 times that of plastic si systems. Even carbon steel can be almost twice um, the cost of PVC. So in general, it can be made of plastic. The life of the material can improve because it, it's an underwater vehicle. Plastics are widely used, metals are widely used, and of course, uh, plastic can be harsh on the environment. But uh, there are some development around, for example, uh, making plastic out of avocado seeds. Uh, there's a factory in the, north, in the northern part of Mexico, specifically Monterrey, where there's a factory that is making dispensable cutlery out of avocado seeds. Avocado seeds. Um, but in general, there's a lot of research and the process are being uh, better every time. But I don't see it. Uh, possible in ROVs, they have to be very efficient. So this is a general overview of ROVs. They are highly complex machines as, as they are uh, an integration of electronics uh, and mechanical pieces. And well, you, you have seen, it, seen them in here. It's really hard to control them, but they are super useful and they save a lot of lives every day. Even for educational purposes, they are amazing. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.